Hey everybody, welcome to week five of Emmanuel, a study of the New Testament. I'm Reverend Kimberly Constant, and today I'll be taking you through the material that we have been reading in the Gospel of Luke. So as I've told you earlier, we at, at first were really flipping back and forth in kind of setting some of the Gospel accounts side by side. Now we've been looking at bigger chunks in each set of Gospel to get us to what I call the midpoint of Jesus' ministry. And then we're going to go back to looking at a few accounts side by side again. So this week we've been reading through the Gospel of Luke, taking us from sort of the opening act of Jesus' ministry again to that midpoint. And so this covers Luke chapter 5, verse 12, all the way through to Luke chapter 9, verse 6. So the beginnings of Jesus' ministry in Luke has very many similarities to Mark and Matthew you're going to read stuff and go, I think I've read this exact thing before. Uh, and that is true. But even where he borrows almost directly from Mark or Matthew, a lot of times his stories are in a different location. And that is something we've learned is pretty common um, amongst these gospel writers. They don't all put things in the same place. Some noteworthy, noteworthy differences in content uh, between Luke and Matthew. So some things Luke has that Matthew didn't. And here I'm more comparing to Matthew than to Mark because Matthew kind of followed Mark and then I feel like Luke's following Matthew. And so he's adding or subtracting or moving things around where he wanted to expand upon Matthew's expansion of the original Gospel of Mark. So Luke's Sermon on the Mount, which is actually called the Sermon on the Plain, is much, much shorter than that of Matthew. You probably recognized it because the the opening beatitudes are the same but there's a lot less than in Matthew's sermon on the mount and then Luke adds these woes which we're going to talk about Luke has the parable of the sower I just talked about the parables in my last lecture which was just a bit of a departure we covered things that we haven't even read yet just to kind of give you an overlay of the land what are these parables about what are the truths just a resource for you as you continue to read so the parable of the sower is one that's in all of the Gospels, but on synoptic Gospels. But unlike Matthew, it's not part of an extended section of parables. So Matthew has chapter 13, which is just parable after parable of teaching. And Luke's is more included in the midst of what Jesus is doing. Luke's sending of the 12 is much shorter than in Matthew as well. So Sermon on the Plain, why do scholars call this the Sermon on the Plain when it is a condensed version of Sermon on the Mount? This is a question that I did not know the answer to until I researched this week. Well, it's because of Luke chapter 6, verse 6, 17, which reads, he, meaning Jesus, went down with them and stood on a level place. So I think it's the, the words down and level place that are giving the idea that Luke is putting this sermon in a different location. So some scholars say that Matthew's location for the sermon is the Mount of Beatitudes. And then some say that Luke has it happening by the Sea of Galilee. Well, if you remember from last week, I had a picture on the front of the lectures from last week, week four, that showed you the view of the Galilee, of Galilee from the Sea of Galilee, sorry, from the Mount of Beatitudes. And it's not that far off. Like you can absolutely see it. And just some food for thought. I have been to Israel. I have been to the Mount of Beatitudes. And yes, this is a, it's a big hill, but there are also level places on that hillside. It's like any hill where there's some parts that are steep and craggly and some parts that are just more naturally flat where you could gather a group of people or Jesus could stand and see over the people. So it could be that the people kind of were dotted down the hillside and Jesus found a level place to stand to deliver the sermon. I think I think it's just it could be both and that, that it, we might be reading too much into it to try to say it's a different location. Nevertheless, the tenor of the sermon remains the same. But Luke does add this section called the woes. And this is in chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. And this section offers what turns out to be a reversal of the blessings of the Beatitudes. 
it's warning. It's woes pronounced against those who um, amass material wealth and fall in love with it. There is danger inherent in material goods and in money. Money itself, not evil. Material goods, not evil. You're not evil if you have them. You don't have bad faith if you have stuff. You have starting to go down the slippery slope if you love your stuff. <laughs> if your stuff matters to you more than the kingdom of God, more than Jesus. If, you know, you think about what would I do if Jesus knocked on my door right now and said, come follow me. Uh, would you be able to do it? Or would you think, oh, I can't leave all these things, the stuff, the people, um, so that's the question to ask. And so here he's saying there is risk because it's very easy to think of yourself as self-sufficient if you have things. Those of us, most of us who live in the Western world, especially the United States or, you know, some other places around the world that have resources and people live such comfortable lives that we inevitably take for granted, it can be very easy to not need to be in prayer. We have our daily bread. We have more than we need in terms of clothes. We have roofs over our head and cars to drive and a grocery store with so many options. It's staggering. Uh, so it can, you know, we don't have that sense of every single moment I am relying on Jesus. Like, or think about Jesus himself when he was been, being tempted by Satan and he was hungry because he had fasted for so long. And every ounce of energy he had was given to him by God in that moment. He was depleted. He was, you know, being attacked. The temptation was great and God had to supply his every need. And so he was hanging on God's word. He wasn't opening his mouth. He barely spoke anything of his own, only quoting the word of God for the most part because he had to rely on God. For us, when things are comfortable, when, I mean, I'm I film these lectures sitting in my closet because it's the hopefully most quiet place except when my dogs are in here with me. And, you know, I'm surrounded by clothes right now, like multiple clothes, clothes that I used to wear when I was a pastor that I hardly ever wear anymore because I don't get dressed up and go into work like I used to. Um, so it's, it's humbling to think about this. Uh, it also can be very easy to think of oneself as above faith. You know, you might have heard people say that. I don't need God. Why do I need the kingdom of heaven? It's all just, it's all just make believe, and I, I'm fine. And you know, heaven is here and now. Those are all things you hear people say because, again, when you have a lot of stuff, you start to be able to think you can satisfy your own needs. And the danger is that we can lose the hunger for the unseen spiritual kingdom of God. We can lose our sense of that hole that God's put in us that's meant to be filled by God. We fill it with so much other stuff that we kind of numb ourselves to its existence. And we, we lose our way. We turn further and further away from God and it becomes harder for us to hear him knocking on the door. So in the Sermon on the Plain, he includes the segment on judgment, which we also saw in Matthew, but he offers a slightly, just a little teeny bit more of an expanded version. And here he's reminding us of the dangers of judgment, but then he also talks about condemnation and forgiveness. And so Jesus is saying, we do not judge nor condemn. This is the, the thing I will stand on my soapbox and preach until the end of time. We do not judge. That is not our job. It is not our job to condemn people. We don't have to decide if someone's being sinful or not. That is not our job. The only thing here, the positive, we need to forgive. Judgment is for Jesus and Jesus alone. We are tasked with practicing forgiveness. And then later on it says, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So what does this mean? Well, we know Jesus has offered grace and mercy to everyone while we were yet sinners. So what does he mean here? It doesn't mean that if you don't forgive, you'll never be forgiven. Or if you don't, you know, act with loving kindness at every single moment, that you're not going to receive loving kindness from God. What Jesus is saying is the more we follow him, the more we live into Jesus' righteousness by not condemning, by not judging, and offering forgiveness and love, then the more filled with the Holy Spirit we will become. 
as we pour ourselves out in self-sacrificial love, just like Jesus did, God will give us strength that far exceeds our limited supply. Jesus' life is a testimony to this truth. We're going to see it as we continue to read. He gives and gives and gives, including his own life, and he is never depleted to the point of not having anything left to give. God always gives him strength and wisdom and insight and love beyond what we can imagine. I'm exhausted just reading about the first part of his ministry, let alone to think about the horrible things that are coming for him. And he keeps pouring himself out over and over again, and he is never emptied because God is right there to give him even more. And that's the thing. we talked. I talked about this in the lecture on the parables too. The more you hunger for knowledge, the more you ask Jesus to explain to you the parable that doesn't make sense, he's going to explain it and you're going to learn more and you're going to grow in your faith. It's the same thing here with forgiveness. It's the same thing with love. It's the same thing with stopping yourself from words of judgment or condemnation. The more we practice muscle memory, right? The more we lift these weights of not judging and not condemning and forgiving, the stronger we're going to become because God is going to be right there filling us up and we're going to grow closer to God and we're going to journey deeper and we're going to go from that shallow place of faith that we all start out at to the deep waters where there is so much reward for us. And then we read a similar sentiment in Luke chapter 8, verse 18. It says, Consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, will be taken from them. Again, we've got this same idea with the parables, same idea as this word about judgment and forgiveness. The more we listen, the more we hunger for knowledge and wisdom of God, the more we will receive. Meanwhile, those people who are so prideful that they don't think they need it because they think they are so wise in their own right, they're going to lose it one day because when God's kingdom comes to its full fruition, those people who have not chosen to humble themselves and to follow Jesus, they're going to be you know, liable to the judgment of God. Um, and I wouldn't want to be in that position. So they... They will lose what they think they have, while those who are scared because God's calling us into the deep waters, we're going to get more than we have. We're going to be sustained there. Uh, if we content ourselves with shallow faith, then we will stay in the shallows. So the key here, as with the parables, is desire and intention. We are all freely extended grace, every single person. And that grace is there as a free gift for us to receive. All we have to do is say, I want that grace. I want to believe in you, Jesus. Help me. Uh, but then Jesus wants us to go further. Because if we just stay in that place of kind of more shallow faith, we're missing out on so much of the kingdom of God that is here and now and present and available to us in our earthly life. Jesus wants us to go into the deep water. And we're going to see him, in fact, Play this out with Peter, calling him into deep water. Jesus wants us to go to that place where only faith sustains us. Where not our stuff, not our knowledge we've acquired in however many years we've lived on this planet, not the amount of people we can say love us, uh, where all we have is faith and that faith sustains us. Because it is there, in the place where only faith sustains us, that Jesus meets us with the strength we need. And then we realize, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Because Jesus is going to be right there to meet me in my need. And so that gives us to this place of growth and maturity. We move beyond, Paul's going to say, mere spiritual milk to the meat of discipleship. And that's when we truly open ourselves up to serving God and to humbling ourselves and to surrendering to him every single day. So another unique aspect that I wanted to call out in the Gospel of Luke is the women of Luke. So all of the synoptic Gospels we've seen focus on Jesus' call and response. What is unique to Luke is that he 
looks even further to women. And there are far more women in the Gospel of Luke and his book of Acts than are in any of the other Gospels probably combined. So some women we see talked about in this segment we just read. In chapter 7, uh, and starting in verse 11, there's a story about a widow's son who is raised from the dead in a place called Nain. This is an area near Nazareth, which, and this is where we're going to geek out, those of you who know the Old Testament, this is purported to be the site where the Shunammite woman lived. So her story in the Old Testament, she had a son, he fell ill, and he died. And she had, at that time, had a strong friendship with the prophet Elijah. And uh, she sent for him and said, how could this have happened to this son? Because she, you know, like most women in the Old Testament, couldn't get pregnant. And so she was granted this child, and it was such a gift from God. And then she's like, why would he let me have this child just to take this child from me? And so her son is raised from the dead by the prophet Elisha in the Old Testament. And so in that same place, I have chills just thinking about it, here comes Jesus and raises another woman's son from the dead with so much more implications because unlike Elisha, uh, Jesus is going to be able to guarantee this child eternal life in the kingdom of God. Um, then we have chapter 7, starting verse 36. Um, a woman shows Jesus great love. While in a sinful and probably unclean state, it's pointed out that she's a sinner. We're going to talk about that um, more in a minute. And she receives forgiveness for her sins. Then we see a list of women in chapter 8 at the very, very beginning. Women are listed as benefactors and disciples of Jesus, including Mary Magdalene, who is said to have been healed of seven demons. And then we have in eight, chapter 8, starting in verse 40, the account that we've already read about uh, in Matthew, where Jesus heals Jairus' daughter, as well as the woman who was bleeding for 12 years. So those stories aren't unique to, God, to the Luke's gospel, but at this point in the other two that we've read, that's about all of the women we see. So look how much Luke adds to that in his discussion of women. And then, uh, so let's go deeper into the story of the woman who an anointed Christ. So this is chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. In this story, we note that Jesus is dining with the Pharisees. And you might think, what? <laughs> I thought they were his enemies. Well, it could be that some of these Pharisees were more open to Jesus' ministry. Or it could be that this Pharisee, whose name is Simon, was hoping to kind of catch Jesus in an inconsistency. inconsistency. They are always sort of trying to trap him or ask him a question that they think he won't be able to answer. Just something that they're hoping will show himself to be not who he says he is. We don't really know, but it seems to me that if Jesus is invited, he's coming to your he's coming in to your dining room and eating with you, which I love that about Jesus. Um, and so one of the things that makes me think Simon is kind of maybe has some ulterior motives here is that uh, when the woman comes in, he thinks to himself, well, if Jesus really were a prophet, he would know that this woman is a sinner. And so good old Simon decides he needs to make that known to Jesus. And so this allows Luke to set up a contrast between the sinful woman who worships Jesus with such an outpouring of faith and love, even though she's still sinful. He hasn't done a miracle for her. He hasn't healed her. He hasn't changed her situation. <laughs> She was probably considered unclean. I'm sure the Pharisee was horrified that she was even coming into his house. And yet Jesus receives this and she pours out her love, this expensive bottle, alabaster bottle of perfume, which probably cost everything that she had. And she just lavishes her tears and, and wiping his feet with her hair. Such an expression of love. And so the Pharisee, of course, <laughs> does not like this. Um, and then Jesus uses this as a teaching opportunity and says, whoever has been forgiven little loves little. So what does he mean by this? Well, the Pharisee thought himself to be righteous. He was a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, an Israelite of good standing. Of course, he thought he was right righteous. But in his pride, he did not have a soft heart to recognize Jesus in front of him and that what he had thought about the Messiah was not correct. Jesus was going to be a very different Messiah. And instead of receiving that, the Pharisees hardened their hearts even further. 
And so the Pharisee, Jesus says, well, you didn't do any of this for me. You didn't greet me in this way. Um, he didn't worship Jesus as Jesus deserved. He didn't even really do some of the things that just any host should do for a guest at his house. The Pharisee didn't think he needed forgiveness. I think the Pharisee thought himself to be above Jesus. He did not see Jesus with eyes of humility or with a heart of love or with gratitude for the presence of God in his midst. And yet this woman did. And the point of the story, we need to love Jesus, not just believe in him. Again, there's this consistent challenge to move from shallow faith into the deep faith where we just absolutely love and pour out everything we have for Jesus because we recognize he is God in our midst. So note Jesus now, how does he react towards each of the people, the Pharisee and the woman? He is honest, he is gentle, and he is also direct. Jesus doesn't back down from speaking truth, but he just so perfectly threads the needle of speaking truth and still being kind and loving. He doesn't enumerate the woman's sins. He doesn't task herself with ridding herself of these sins. He's not horrified that a sinful woman is crying on his feet. Jesus simply acknowledges her faith and says that it has saved her and that she is forgiven. And to the Pharisee, he addresses that which the Pharisee is thinking and says, you need to reconsider. We also note that in Jesus' encounters, he doesn't classify people or limit his interactions with people because of their sinfulness. He goes and dines at Simon the Pharisee's house. He would have just as equally gone and dined at the house of this woman who was crying onto his feet. And I love what he says to Simon the Pharisee. Do you see this woman? There is something about that verse this time around that makes me almost tear up. Like, do you see this woman? Imagine this woman. I bet no one saw her except for the men that used her. She most likely was a prostitute, used and abused by men, probably had no other means of, of subsistence because if you weren't, didn't have a husband and a father to take care of you, that's kind of what you had to do become was a prostitute. There was no other way of making money or a living for women in this time under Roman rule. Uh, she could have even been a slave. Who knows? She was not in a position. There was no agency. That This is why Luke talks about women so much. There was absolutely no agency for women. They were considered less than and beneath men. And he says, look at her. Do you see her? And Jesus says that for each one of us. Do you see her? Do you see him? Because I do. I see beyond what you see on the outside. I see beyond this story that you've constructed about this person, this narrative that you tell yourself. I know the truth. I know the heart. I know those circumstances. I see her. I see you. I see everyone. And of course, Simon couldn't see. He was blinded by his own pridefulness, by, you know, this arbitrary delineation. She can't be near me because she's unclean. When we do the Old Testament next year, we're going to see God didn't have a law about, um, you know, not being able to eat with people. Certainly if he was going to go to the temple, he would have needed to engage in some sort of purity ritual, but they, they're putting up much more barriers between people than God ever intended. Jesus sees us always, and Jesus doesn't separate us by the categories that we use to separate ourselves. Jesus offers grace and mercy to everyone. It's up to us to receive it and to receive it in a transformative way. Again, to go from that shallow faith to deeper faith. We can receive little forgiveness because we're unwilling to fully humble ourselves and submit. And so we stay in a shallow place. We don't receive as much teaching. We don't get as many gifts of the Spirit. We don't give as many, get as many opportunities to you know, be the hands and feet and voices and ears and hearts of Jesus because we're still in the shallow water. Or we can fully humble ourselves and submit and open ourselves up to God with great love and gratitude and then just see what God will do. So the implications and applications of some of these accounts 
Um, Luke highlights, first and foremost for me, one of the marvelous truths of Jesus, equality. Women are given a place in Jesus' ministry. They are some of his biggest financial supporters. They are also disciples. We're going to see them continue to have a, a, a prominent place in his ministry. They're going to be there at the foot of the cross, and they're going to be some of the leaders in the early church. He treats women with gentleness and respect and kindness, some perhaps being seen for the first time. Luke also highlights the key to deeper discipleship, a hunger for more, the desire to learn more, to be more righteous, to be more faithful to become more like Jesus. Again, that's what takes us from shallow faith to the deep end of the pool. And the further we journey, the greater reward because we see God more. It's not that we get more of God. God is always with us. Whether we acknowledge him or not, God is never going to leave you. God is never going to stop pursuing you. Never going to stop knocking at the door of your heart. God is always with you. But the further we go into the deep end of the pool, the more we dive into this path of discipleship, we're going to be more aware of God. Uh, God's going to give us more opportunities to be his ambassadors. And we're going to see things that, you know, this is an undeniable work of God because we will know we've gone beyond our human limits. When God calls you into the deep water, sometimes you say, but I don't know how to swim, God. And God says, I'm going to hold you up. You have to trust in me. And that's where we want to get to that place where God is holding us up. And because of it, our faith gets deeper because it's like, all right, it's real. God's real because I can't do this on my own. God helps us to do that which we think is impossible, to forgive the person that has deeply hurt and wronged us. And by forgiveness, I don't mean that you have to forget. I don't mean that you have to have a relationship with this person. You absolutely need safe boundaries Sometimes forgiveness is going to be something that happens with you and God and you're not ever going to talk to or see that person again. And that is absolutely okay. You don't need to talk to or see that person to extend forgiveness to someone. So God helps us to forgive when we might think it's impossible. God helps us to achieve the things that seem like just dreams to us. He helps us to truly become more and more like Jesus, which when you're starting out in the shallow end of faith, it sometimes seems impossible. I'm never going to be better. I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never going to get over this cycle of sin that I'm stuck in. Well, indeed you will. You've got to go into the deep water to do it. So the challenge for us is to first cultivate a desire for more. This is very honest prayer, and you can pray these honest things to God. You can say, I'm scared of the deep water. Like the, the shallow end, it's comfortable for me, God. So help me to be willing to step out of my comfort zone. Help me to desire more. That can be your starting prayer and that's okay. God will nurture that hunger within you. Then we pray, this is the hard one, for God to give us opportunities to step into the deep water of faith. Notice that God does not say we have to strengthen ourselves. God does not say we have to figure things out on our own. God does not say we have to somehow increase our own faith. This is not pull your bootstraps up and get to work, people. God does all the work here. Grace does all the work. All God is asking us to do is submit and ask him for more. And then he's the one that gives us the ability to forgive. He's the one that gives us the ability to love those who seem unlovable. He's the one who gives us the ability to go after the lost sheep and to be his hands and feet, and to do all sorts of things for the glory of his kingdom. Is this scary? Yes, <laughs> it is scary to go into the deep end. Is it worth it? Always. God is always with you, and he will be with you through the deepest of waters and the highest of mountains. You just got to let go. You've got to surrender, and you've got to trust God. All right, that brings us to the end of this section on Luke. So next week we will be looking at um, some readings from John, which will be quite different than what we've been looking at. And then, like I said, we're going to meet, meet up again at about the midpoint of Jesus' ministry and look at a few accounts that we find in all of the Gospels before we then kind of break back out again. All right, let me pray for us. Gracious God, 
Thank you for the challenge to enter into that deep water, Lord. I pray that you would nurture within each one of us listening that is praying right now, God. Nurture within us that desire for more. God, help us to want to be uh, people who leave the comfort zone and go into the place that scares us. God, help us to surrender it all, to let go, and to just trust you, to know that you are absolutely going to catch us, that you are going to be right there. Even if things are hard and don't turn out like we thought they would, that doesn't mean we're doing it wrong, God. And you are always, always with us. So Lord, help us to take that challenge. Show us the places where we can step into deep water, where you're calling us to do so, and give us the courage to say yes. And then Lord, help us to surrender to you every day, every moment, every decision, so that you can begin to manifest the presence of your Holy Spirit within us. Lord, help us to see you at work all around in ways big and small, and help us to strengthen that ability to see you so that it just becomes something overwhelming, a part of every day we see you at work. All right, I pray these things in your name, God, trusting and knowing that you are able to do everything and anything. Nothing is impossible for you through faith. And truly through all things, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I'll see you next week. And remember to check out the podcast. It will be available for you Wednesday morning, and that will have um, an extended look at the parable of the sower. Take care.